Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta and welcome to part 20 of the return of the Divine Sophia. This is our last chapter, our last recording of this reading. I have thoroughly enjoyed it. Please leave me your thoughts down in the comment section below. Next week, we will be starting The Woman with the Alabaster Jar. So I will put a link to this video down below. Now, before we get started, I am having some issues with my equipment today. Of course, I'm recording this during Mercury Retrograde. Um, it will be released after Mercury Retrograde. So I'm just going to quickly ask that Michael and Gabriel and any of these beings of the highest light that are here for our highest good, I ask that you come in right now and re re protect this recording, protect the equipment, make sure that everything that I say, what I need to say, what you would like for me to say to help all of humanity, please keep us safe. And only if there are any nefarious beings here that are trying to disrupt this teaching for any reason by messing with the equipment, I ask that you escort them out. I do not consent to them being here. They cannot use any of my weaknesses or my wounds as a loophole to come in. They have no right to be here in this space. And I do not give consent. So I ask that you remove them immediately. With that being said, we are going to be starting on page 432 of my book today, which is chapter 23, the final chapter. Now, also, before we get into the reading, we are, this is the week of the beginning of the 60 day shadow work challenge. If you have not gotten a template and you would like to participate, even though the challenge started on Saturday, you can still email me at shadowworkchallenge at gmail.com and I will send you the template. It's never too late to start. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started on this final chapter, chapter 23 a return to the circle. Great one who became heaven, thou didst assume power, thou didst stir, thou hast filled all places with thy beauty. The whole earth lies beneath thee, thou hast taken possession of it. Thou encloseth the earth and all things in thy arms. Henry Frankfurt, Kingship and the Gods. June 21st, the summer solstice. I awoke in the first glimmers of gray dawn and went out to meet the sunrise. Throwing a blanket over my shoulders, I made my way out into the backyard and sat cross-legged in the medicine circle that I had built only a few months before. Of all eight high holy days, the summer solstice was the longest day of the year and the one that most celebrated the victory of light. I had brought cornmeal and tobacco to offer Mother Earth two of the substances most sacred to the native peoples. As I poured the soft golden corn mill onto the ground in prayer, I laced it with a sacred herb of tobacco, an herb known for bringing stillness and focus. I realized that they were both the color of the sun. These offerings were not only for Isis, the original corn maiden, who had long ago brought us bounty, but for all the great solar gods and goddesses who had given their lives to service and shared their wisdom through the ages with humanity. And I will say it's interesting. There is a form of, of plant medicine that deals with tobacco. There is tobacco therapy. And isn't it interesting how the controllers kind of ruined that or inverted that with nicotine, right? So all this plant medicine, all this stuff, again, the darkness can't create anything. Only the light can. And what the darkness does it is, is it steals from the light or mimics the light and inverts the light. Okay, so it's interesting. Something we all need to remember as we go forward, instead of having a vigilante attitude where we're going to destroy anything we perceive to be bad, we have to understand that at first it was good and heal it instead of destroy it. Because the path of Lucifer is the path of destruction. The path of God is the path of healing. Five minutes later, the light began to break across the horizon. Dear Lord, I prayed, accept this corn, melon, tobacco as a tribute to your bounty. Know that I, your daughter, honor you in every expression that you have. Help us as human beings to find balance in our world once again, to find the good and sacred in all people, animals, and life. The sun rose through the trees slowly, sending its soft fingers of light across the grass, and I found myself thinking about how the symbol for the sun and for illumination has been the first catalyst that introduced me to the mysteries and to the presences of the goddess in the world. It had come to me so many years ago in that dream. 
not only did the circle with the dot at the center represent illumination, it was the cosmic part from which the entire universe sprang. If this one symbol had led to so many amazing discoveries, I knew that in time the other symbols inscribed upon that wall would unfold their magic to me. If you're not sure what she's referring to, please go back and listen to the first part of this, the chapter one, she talks about this. I closed my eyes and placed my hands over my heart, feeling the light play across my eyelids. Suddenly, the birds broke into song, as if the entire world had just awakened. Heaven and earth, yin and yang. This was the eternal dance of compliments in perfect union. And here I was between the world at dawn. All around me, the earth seemed to be lit with an inner radiance. And I realized that although I was just a tiny dot on this magnificent planet, bathed by the sun, I was part of the infinite intelligence of the universe. I could experience the joy and sorrow, beauty and hope of living here on this glorious planet. My heart was overflowing. I found myself reflecting on all that I had learned in the past few months about the hidden history of our planet and the ancient balanced societies that had lived in partnership without war or oppression. Would we ever be able to return to this state of grace again? Would those who were in power across the world, dedicated to fear and dominance, greed and power, ever allow that vision to be known by others? I didn't know, but I did know that if human beings had once lived in harmony, we were capable of doing it again. Our generation and the ones that followed us had a chance to find this balance again, a path that Yahshua and Magdalene had called the way of the chalice. The chalice was the union of the male and female energies depicted in the phallic stem in the crescent cup. It implied our ability to allow ourselves to be filled with the living nectar of God's exquisite love and to become a vessel of this light. Later, this union of the two would accumulate in the middle path, which was inscribed into the petals of the floor de lis, making a path of integration and wholeness. My mind went back to the passage I had read about the transformation of the world written by Manly P. Hall, who again was a Freemason. And as I said, every time we read from him, we have to understand, yes, Freemasonry is satanic. You know that. Well, you don't know that as a Freemason until you get to the 33rd level. But again, darkness can't create anything. It can only steal from the light and invert. So let's see what they have to say, because even though we don't want to invert the light, we need to understand where the original teachings come from. It is predestined that a golden age shall come again that men shall live together in love and understanding and the earth shall become once more a garden of surpassing beauty as it was in the beginning. In that time, there shall be great institutions for research and records. The arts and crafts shall flourish. But unlike preceding generations, this er era should not pass away. For the God of it shall be beauty. And where beauty in its various aspect rules a people, that people shall remain as permanent in eternity. When we love the beautiful as we now love the dollar, we shall have a great enduring civilization. When we adore the God of harmony as we once worship the God of vengeance, we shall know the inner mystery of life. When we create with symmetry, preserve with integrity and release with joy, then only are we good. Never until we have become one with the good can we be happy for happiness is the realization of the internal beauty that joyously goes forth to mingle itself with the beauty that dwells in space. Could we now begin to envision a world without war or bloodshed? We have been programmed to believe in conflict for so long. The first step was letting people know that it was possible. And there was another way of life beyond the one the world was mirrored in now. I also knew that there were many financial powers that sought to prevent this kind of peaceful world from coming to be in both secular and religious circles. They had been born and bred on conflict, duality and separation, and their religions had taught them that everything else was the work of the devil. But the world was finally changing, slowly but surely. The dualistic energies of the age of Pisces were starting to pass away, and in this new age, anything was possible. How would life change if people really started to honor the Divine Mother and the Di Divine Father once again? 
How would we change if women had the same rights as men and refused to be suppressed? If we valued intuition, creativity, love, and mercy as much as we now valued possessions, money, power, and control, how would our world change if we truly lived as if we were all connected, treating others as if they were an extension of ourselves? That was the golden rule, wasn't it? How would life change if we made decisions regarding our fuel supplies that honored the earth? What if we started honoring the animals instead of slaughtering them for profit or sport? Would we be able to hear them speak telepathically as native cultures claimed we once had? How would life change if we began to take the time to tune into nature listening to the intelligence of the waters, the whispering of the trees, and the spirit of the cosmos carried on the winds, would we come back into harmony with the spirit of God within? I hoped so. I reflected on how history had been rewritten again and again by the victors in a political war of the mind, trapping us between the threat of a punishing God and the shadows of a boogeyman named Satan. I realized that we have long been engaged in a war of the hearts, minds, and spirits of humankind, an invisible prison designed to keep us in an endless loop of materialism, fear, and self-doubt, all created to prevent us from discovering the divine potential that lies within our very hearts. Yet now, here on the cusp of the age of Aquarius, an era whose symbol is the outpouring of heavenly wisdom from the stars, Hope was beginning to rise. Perhaps this time the dream of a more loving society might become a reality. Then I found myself reflecting on all those brave men and women who had given their lives throughout the centuries to keep the dream of equality alive for us today. Those who had sacrificed everything so that this hidden knowledge of a more balanced wisdom might not be obliterated. The Gnostics, Cathars, Kabbalists, Ma well, not Masons, healers, Knights Templars, Herbalists, Druid, Science, Philosophers, Mystic, Artists, many had withstood the tortures of the past so that today we might awaken from the amnesia and break the chains of belief that have kept us in bondage for so long. Today, on the day of the greatest light, I saluted their courage, their heart, and their sacrifice. And I will say about the Masons, though, I do believe the Masons started off as a good organization and then it got, it got corrupted and and people came in and switched it around and changed it up and inverted it just like the Knights Templar same thing so you know when I finished my meditation the sun was at the top of the trees I stood up stretching and then went inside to shower and dress I packed my car with blankets food and a sleeping bag for Shasta had invited any of us who wished to do so to spend the night in the grove I pulled up in front of her house in the early afternoon and made my way down the garden with the other women who were just setting up their tents around the garden's perimeter. Then the group assembled near Mary's garden to eat a meal of tuna, hummus, and pita bread. Around us, the trees seemed to shimmer with radiance, and the afternoon sunlight touched every leaf as if it were holy. When we had finished eating, Shasta began to speak. Today, you will be offering your first ceremony to the Divine Mother. But before we begin, I want to hear what has happened in your life since we last met. How has the goddess began working in your life? Meg began relating a story about how Lakshmi, the lady of generosity, had opened up funding for a children's project in Washington, creating abundance for hungry children across the nation. Alex told us how the goddess Diana had inspired her to join a softball team in her office, and now she was thinking about enrolling in a Qigong class. Donna reported that after choosing Demeter, the harvest goddess, she had suddenly been inspired to buy some living herbs at the supermarket. Now she had a collection of rosemary, lavender, lemon balm, oregano, basil growing in pots on her patio. She had intended to use the plants for cooking, but now she was thinking of creating herbal salt baths. Wow, I marveled. The goddess certainly has been hard at work. Claudia spoke next. She had chosen time at the celestial dragon, and she had no idea how to relate to her. Shasta told her that many people believed time at had actually been a large planet located where the asteroid belt is now. It had been destroyed by an even larger planet, changing its destiny forever. Time at, Shasta explained, 
is about completely restructuring your life. Claudia nodded thoughtfully. I had known Claudia for years, and she had a successful career already as a makeup artist in Hollywood and Atlanta. Although she was fabulous at her craft, her heart longed for something more with more meaning. I've been thinking about studying astrology, she said in a tentative voice. I might even become a professional astrologer. We all started laughing. Of course, a goddess of the heavens, perfect. When I shared my story about Ishtar and the romantic relationship that would have certainly left me drained of energy, the circle became silent. Shasta waited until I finished to share her insight. Sometimes the lesson is not about making the same mistake, she explained, but about choosing a more empowering path. The goddess and her stories live on in every one of us, men and women alike. We are all heroes and heroines of her legacy. What she has done, we have also done. The paths we travel now, she has traveled before. So because the Divine Mother has been there before us, she can help us make wiser decisions. When all the women had finished sharing, Shasta began her lesson for the day. Over the past few months, as we have moved from winter into spring, you have heard many stories about the descent of the god or goddess into the underworld and their return to the light. While these may be myths or legend, the tale they tell is true. We are all aspects of the great mother living in the world of light and shadows. Like the legend of sleeping beauty, we are slumbering in ignorance and like her, we can also awake. Today is one of the eight high holy days where the crack between the worlds becomes thinner and you have a chance to travel between the worlds. While the summer solstice celebrates the illumination of the great solar lords, we must also remember to honor the divine feminine for the goddess is also solar, just as some gods are also lunar. Solar goddess? Lunar gods? Even Emerald looks surprised. I never thought outside of this classic stereotype that the male was solar while the female was lunar. As I looked across the, the circle, I could see the same of the other men were equal, women were equally as surprised. She continued, in Egypt, both Hosanyu and Thoth were linked to the moon. Thoth chose the moon because he discovered its effect on the human, mineral, plant, and animal kingdom. And the young god Kasano ruled the changing cycles of mortal time. And that's right, we've been reading the Emerald Tablets and Thoth is associated with the moon, the aponic energy, just as predominantly females are. The intuition, the emotional side of life. I had no idea. The Egyptians clearly knew that everyone contained both polarities. Shasta went on. Within the goddess path, some of the most ancient female deities are solar, including Shekmet, the goddess of healing and war, and Muratsu, the goddess of the sun, and Bast, the goddess of joy. But the rarest of all the gods and goddesses are those who are both lunar and solar, like Isis. These are the ones who have in integrated both polarities to achieve mastery. The most famous of these divine pairs in the ancient world were Isis and Osiris, while the teachers of our ages were Yahshua and Magdalene. She looked around the circle to see if we were falling. Isis and Osiris were said to have been twins in the celestial room, a metaphor for their true identities as divine mother and father of all. It sounded like some incarnation of Rigel and Ariel to me. Osiris is solar and Isis is lunar, but Osiris can also be lunar while Isis can be solar. They are perfectly balanced pair. When Isis is partnered with Nephthys, her dark sister who rules the unconscious realms, she is expansive, outwardly flowing solar aspect of the female, while Nephthys is the receptive, reflective aspect of the lunar. And when you compare Isis and Osiris to Nephthys and Sets as couples, Isis and Osiris are the female and male expressions of light, while Nephthys and Set are the male and female aspects of darker or more hidden realms. Hence why the darkness, the dark the dark cults, the, the, the controllers, worship Set. They want us to think Osiris is bad, but they actually worship Set. Okay? That's why it's super important that we educate ourselves and not just take people's word for it, but are constantly researching for ourselves too, so we're never duped again. Shasta continued her narrative. When we begin to speak about the yin and yang, we are really speaking about the balance that leads to mastery. 
I have not told you yet the true tale of Isis and Osiris and how they helped to save humanity after the Great Flood, but today seems like a perfect time. Several of the women shifted as if getting ready for a story, Shasta began. After the Great Flood, the world was in chaos. People were starving, so cannibalism was rampant. Isis and Osiris decided to help. And since I Osiris was a musician, he gathered people together with music and fed them. But he also brought seeds and planting tools and taught them skills for growing their own food, as well as the spiritual principles of enlightenment. Because of this, he was called the green god or the god of regeneration. This is why he is painted green in the temples. Meanwhile, Isis was left to bring order to Egypt. She reestablished temples to God, ended cannibalism, instituted marriage, created the first sailing ships, invented the first loom, and taught the arts of agriculture to her people once again. Together, they established Mahat, the cosmic law by which all pharaohs of Egypt were except, expected to rule. Mahat is a goddess. She is also the symbol for the principle of cosmic truth. Meanwhile, Set, Osiris's half-brother, was given southern Egypt to rule, but he was jealous of Osiris and decided that he wanted Isis for himself. So he tricked Osiris into lying down inside a golden coffin, then sealed it and threw it into the Nile, stealing Osiris's land for himself. Isis was grief-stricken and fled the palace where she knew that this would mean for Egypt. The only chance she had was to save her husband. So along with her nephew Anubis, she set out to find him. After a long search, she finally located his coffin in Bi Bibelus, where it had been hidden in a huge uh, Tamaric tree and had grown up around it. The tree had been cut down by the king of Bibelus for one of his temples, and through a long and complicated process, Isis eventually pried his coffin from the tree and took it back to Egypt. Through magic, she temporarily brought Is Osiris back to life, impregnating herself with a seed, and then she left to find help. But while she was gone, Set found his brother's body and cut him into 14 pieces. Yikes, that sounded grisly. Shasta went on. Knowing what the peace, knowing that the peace of the kingdom was at stake, Isis gathered up the pieces of her husband's body and bound the parts back together, creating the first funerary rites in Egypt. However, the only piece of the body that Isis could not find was his phallus. Shasta looked around the circle. What is the deeper meaning of this story? We all looked at one another, stunned. I had no idea. I was still shocked at the idea that someone would dismember such a compassionate being. Susan cleared her throat uncomfortably, and Donna crossed her legs. After a minute, when it was clear that none of us knew how to even begin to decode the story, Shasta spoke. Each of us are just like Isis searching for the scattered pieces of ourself and trying to put them back together. But the only thing that can bend us is the healing power of love. It is through the heart that we are made whole. Ah, he suddenly got it. As a goddess whose heart beat in time with the Divine Mother's, Isis had the power to bring the scattered pieces of Osiris's body back together and raise him from the dead. He symbolized the Christ within, and she symbolized the redeeming qualities of love that can unite and revive us. After a minute, Donna said, but what does the phallus represent? Shasta looked around the circle. Any ideas? I could have under understood the story more easily, I thought if it was the heart that was missing, but what did the phallus represent, I wondered. The phallus is the regenerating principle of life itself. When we find it, we shall awaken Osiris and bring him back to life. I was trying to put the symbols together in my mind. The scattered parts of Osiris were like the assortments of archetypes that live within us. They are the many selves that we have left scattered throughout time, not only in this life, but in our past incarnations. Only by remembering, healing, and reuniting those lost aspects of who we are can we awaken the Christ that lives within. And the only thing that had the power to do this was love. In a very literal sense, the phallus is the one part of a man's body that creates new life. And like the spine, the phallic symbol has long been connected to the tree of life. So while love is the power that unites and heals us, we must then find our way to unite ourselves with the mystical power of the tree of life, a symbol of the way of the return to the source, who we are. Those Egyptian sages were certainly clever, weren't they? Yeah, they were Atlantean. They're us. 
They had created symbols that had encoded myth and legend that would unfurl their wisdom to us every day if we could only decipher the symbol's true significance. So once again, the obelisk, you guys, that's the spine. It has nothing to do with the literal penis of Osiris. If you still believe that and you're still falling for that shit, then you're falling for just another cabal-controlled psyop, right? The last thing the, co the controllers want us to do is to wake up and realize the truth. The allegory of the christened one who is divided from himself and can only be healed by the power of the divine feminine is not about only about us as individuals, Shasta continued. It is also about our fragmented societies that lie scattered like broken bodies in our past. We have forgotten that the trail of our own history and to be healed, we must remember the pieces of the journey that have brought us here so that we can heal the past, change the present and create a positive future. Then we can come back into union with the cosmos, but only love can make us whole. Shasta look around the circle. I was just surprised to see tears on the cheeks of some of the women, but I knew how they felt. We have been lost for so long in the one underworld. The possibility that we would someday awaken as a peaceful planet was almost beyond imagining. The place where healing appears is at the heart, Shasta explained. It is a place where all judgment fades. All polarities unite. Silently, she placed her hands over her heart. After a few moments, we joined her, feeling ourselves come truly present in the moment. Then she rose to her feet and the group rose with her. Shasta picked up a rattle and passed the basket of gourd rattles around the circle. Slowly, we each chose one. I closed my eyes and took a breath, feeling my heart swell within me with the radiance of the moment. Then Shasta began to speak. We all come from the goddess and to her, we shall return. Like a drop of rain flowing to the ocean, we all began to dance, making a long, uh, circly path through the entire garden. At every alcove, we stopped, and one of the women would offer a ceremony to the goddess she had chosen. Some sang songs, some danced, others used symbols or prayers. As the many faces of the mother moved into our hearts, I realized that each of us were being introduced to each of the goddesses. And that some of them were speaking silently in the power and the beauty of the rituals. When we had finally finished, we found ourselves standing inside the medicine circle at the base of the garden as the sun was going down. Shasta had laid a pile of wood and fire pit at the center of the wheel. Now she reached down and lit the logs, letting the gold and red flames lick up into the darkening blue sky. The wood popped and crackled, releasing its life force to offer us life and light. For a long time, no one spoke. Everything we needed was in this moment. Finally, little Meg cleared her throat and began to chat. My light to your light, sister and friend. Bless now the children from beginning to end. Sarah looked over at her and picked up Man's, Meg's chant. Heal now our sorrow, our sadness and pain, and help us return to your wisdom again. Sharon looked over with a smile on her face. Awaken our hearts and remind us to give, and we may embody the power to live. Imril lifted her head and said proudly, rekindle the wisdom that lies in our heart and banish the darkness that keeps us apart. Claudia picked up the chant. Give us the strength and the power to love that we may join earth with the heavens above. Suddenly the words rose in my mind unbinded as if we were all listening to the same unbroken song. In moments bold and currents deep, let us awaken those who sleep. Alex followed. The time has come and the people yearn for love and healing and peace to return. Donna finished the spontaneous chat. Awaken the mother, let peace come to earth. For those, for we are those who bring the world to rebirth. When the mantra had completed itself, we stood in fullness of the silence with our arms laced over one another's shoulders. The firelight licked our faces and we were complete. That night, as I lay sleeping beneath the stars, I had a great vision. Whether it was a vision or a prophecy, I cannot say, but I was staring at the surface of a still blue pond in a moment before the first drop of water fell and the heartbeat of the world began. Like an echo, 
rippling out across a smooth circle of fluid waters, this drop spread out to create everything. Then I heard a chime through the silence, rippling through the universe. With the timber of a thousand Tibetan chants, the voices began, Odiana, 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 over and over again. From this sound flowed atoms, tones, harmonies, and galaxies, all of it. I was caught up in the power of its resonant link to the creation itself. Through the sound, I felt Ariel enter my consciousness and speak. I stretched out my inner senses to greet her. But this aspect of the Great Mother felt far more ancient than she ever had. Ariel, is that you? You feel like a wise old grandmother. You're different now. An ancient present filled my mind, and I realized that this was the presence behind the world, the first cause, the one the Egyptian had called Atnam, the power behind the Divine Mother and Father. The silence was so deep within me, and there were no words for it. And I realized then that the beings I knew as Ariel and Rajal were the first emanations of this immensity. But this aspect was far older. The one who existed before anything else, the world and the silence itself. Odiana, I whispered, the great mother of all, the one behind the many. Yes, it is I, the voice answered, a hum and a song all at once. Suddenly, I found myself traveling through the deep star filled, the velvety riches of the heavens around me. It was warm and comforting like the mother's womb, not cold and empty. Then I realized that I was actually floating in a great dark ocean and the universes of luminous lights were reflected above me and below me. I had been to this place once before and I felt infinitely safe. You are the grandmother of all, I whispered. Aren't you? That I am. In this place, there were no longer any questions or answers. Here it was all simply being. It was as if my consciousness existed everywhere and everything. I was man and I was woman. I was the animals and I was the plants. I was the plants and I was the stars. I was all of it. And where I perceived myself as separate was only a matter of where I stood in that vast rotation of the wheel. All that we do to others, we also do to ourselves, I thought. Now I truly understood. We were all of it. Tears of gratitude trickled down my face. I serve you, mother, each and every aspect of you, I whispered. The darkness was alive with luminous light. We know you do, child. Then I began to pray. I prayed for guidance, for power, for wisdom. I prayed for humor and endurance. I prayed to hold her presence within my own. And in some small way to be able to embody her ageless wisdom, then another image appeared in my inner sight of a blue forest lake frozen in winter wrapped in the dark night of colorless world beside the lake nestled a village of half frozen people asleep in their homes beneath the moon purple shadows crossed the white blankets of snow the frost of the cold night air everywhere why was she showing me this i wondered what did it mean she whispered through the stillness of the frozen night awaken my child awaken I realized then that this village, these people, this world, they had been asleep for centuries. As I watched, she blew her warm breath across the lake. Ever so slowly, the lake began to thaw. What did this mean? Great mother, who are these people and why are they half frozen? Why are you showing me this? The answer came back. I stir the fires of consciousness now in humanity. They have been sleeping for centuries. I bring them forth from their comas. Are you awakening those who sleep? Is this what is coming into my world? I am. It is. What manner of prophecy is this? I whispered. It's about the resurrection of the spirit. The resurrection of the spirit. What did she mean? Meaning no disrespect, I said, but that sounds rather Christian to me. Behold the vision and tell me what you see, she answered. I looked again and saw a gray dusky dawn over a sleepy village the village was nestled at the foot of some mountains around it and around it a circular lake it looked a lot like the swiss alps but it could have been anywhere over everything even the people there was a layer of frost the great mother leaned over the picture breathing her warm sweet breath over the lake as if slowly falling it and what is happening to the people she asked me I could see that the ice was just beginning to melt from their bodies, like embers rekindling from the ruins of the gray ashes. 
even though none of them could move yet. It was only a matter of time until they were free. I told her what I saw. When you blow your breath upon the mother, they seem to glow from within, deep inside their hearts. It is their spirit I am awakening, she said. They are coming back to life. Then it hit me. Like sleeping beauty, the world has been frozen in its spiritual evolution for a very long time. Now we are beginning to wake up. This is the real meaning of the word resurrection, my daughter, for they have been dead inside for centuries. What killed them, I whispered, wondering what could have put them into this state. Ignorance, deceit, materialism, their own pain. Is this a metaphor for the world? She smiled. You could say that. For over an hour, I lay beneath the stars, moving back and forth between the ocean and the infinite cosmos, and this image of our planetary awakening. I reflected on Odiana, the grandmother spirit beyond time. She was most certainly the goddesses, the Hindus called Aditi, the first cause, the progenitrix who enfolds creation within her womb, the transcendent source of all things, the supreme emper empress. She who manifests all dimensions out of the fraction of a fraction of her majesty. Then I felt the sweet energies of Ariel enter my consciousness, bringing the most sublime kind of love. The hush of her presence filled me, and her words rose unabided in my mind. All things are born of her. She has 10,000 names and 10,000 faces, the eternal law. She is the earth and the heavens, the small and the large, and the mother at the heart of forgiveness. Nothing lives but for her presence. She contains the three flames of the sacred heart. She is the undivided heart from whence we spring and to whom we shall return. Tears welled up in my eyes and prayers fell from my lips. Divine ones, in our reckless youth and arrogance, we have forgotten you, just as a child forgets its parents while playing in the streets. Distracted by the circus, we have forgotten you're like the eternal protectors that you are. You see us, watch us, and allow us to stumble, loving us through all of our errors. Rigel's deep presence then filled my heart, and I spoke in gratitude to all three of them. You are eternal watchers to all of your days. And if we but realize it, we would know that you have created everything for our benefit. The heavens, the planet, the fields and forests, the plants and animals, even our own bodies. You are here in the garden and there in the temple. You are out in the streets and safe in the cottages. Beloveds, you are inside of us and outside of us. If we could only let our blindness go. Ariel's voice was like music. Many have argued that there is only one God, my daughter, while others have said there are many. Do you not yet see that there is only one, the one behind the many, watching, waiting for you to awaken? Yes, all the gods and goddesses are one. And just as Rigel and I have created the universe through our separation and union, this dance of polarity that seeks the oneness is the two of us finding one another again and again in all the worlds of space and time. A circle appeared in my mind and split in two. I knew what this vision was. It was the creator who longed for companionship, but being the one and the only, it did the only thing possible. It split itself in two so that it could behold itself for the first time. From this beginning where the two great powers were born and they recombined to create the limitless light of the illuminated daughter and son ariel spoke the one that is in all things created the angels the humans the gods and goddesses yea it even created us so that it would have companions since you are made in its image how can you not see the divine exist in all things for what is your love for one another but an echo of the great one's love for you and when you enter the eyes of the beloved, you enter the gates of heaven. Love is always the key to the door, even in the heart of God itself. When I and my beloved are one, I dwell in the center of all being. A vision of the universe swept through me, living, laughing, loving, being born and dying, all parts of the endless cycle of forgetting and remembering who we are, losing our way and then finding ourselves again. I saw the entwining of lovers, the birth of babies, the death of the old, and the birth of the new. I saw time in an endless spiral moving upward and downward in succession waves of consciousness in the eternal dance of Brahma, Shiva, and Vishnu, 
the breathing in of the earth, the breathing out of the mountains, the rocks being pushed up into the sky, and the lava flowing out, oceans replacing continents, people perishing and being born again. Like atoms in a vast water of the cosmic sea, we go beneath the waves to explore the bottom, then resurface to fill the sun once again. Yet above and below the waves, life is everywhere, and each dimension holds its treasures. Behind it all, the ancient one watches the great spirit of everywhere, the great spirit of everything. Then my guide's voices spoke together. From the point of light within the mind of God, from the point of love within the heart of God, from the center where the will of God is known. I knew this was the great invocation used by mystic orders of the past. I picked up my pen and began to write down the words as they came through. In the beginning was the one without limits, without judgment, without separation. The one without name, the mystery behind the wisdom, the place before space, eternity before time, prime creator, the essence, the beginning and ending, the circle without the end, the eternal mother. Odiana took over, her voice a deep timbre, then Oriel's echoing inside me like something deep that I had forgotten. All things are contained within me, and all worlds are but an echo of myself. I am the seed of your true nature, even as the acorn contains the insolent energy of the mighty oak. Within you is the power of 10,000 suns, and there is nothing you cannot be if you will only tap into your true self. I am there within, waiting for you to call. If you are willing to listen, I will answer. I am the sound beneath silence. The I am that I am. I finally understood those words. There was no on other beyond that presence. I closed my eyes and listened to the words moving through my heart. Ariel was speaking. And then the creator breathed and the sound that ushered from her was deep wind yea, rather than the sprinkling of a vortex. She moved within herself, a generator of energy, emotion, curiosity, and love. Like the shattering of a million billion stained glass windows, like the beating of a trillion angels' wings not yet born in thought, like the roaring of the waters of creation, she, bur she burst forth into the first mirroring of herself. The one facing one, eternal twins, eternal mirrors. Ariel, Rigel, Isis and Osiris, Magdalene and Yahshua, eternal love, meaning absolute truth. Odiana's voice took over. And who are these ones that we speak about? The father and mother of all. Ariel, love beyond measure, love beyond question, absolute, unconditional, forgiving love before there was anything to forgive. Love that leads back to wholeness the doorway to completion, the fabric upon which creation is built, eternal Mary, the cosmic ocean, Sophia unfolding like a rose whose love spun him into being. Rajal, a song rose unbited in my heart, Lord of creation, ancient of days, universal maker, here's a song in your praise. Odiana's voice went on, the winged one who spans all universes who holds creation in his gaze. The one who came into being from a very, the very thought of love, the longing of love, the companion of love, the reflection of eternal truth, the husband of beauty, the eagle, the falcon, the eternal father. I saw his great wings moving as the tips of his feathers reached out to set the first elements into motion. Fanning the fires, the first light, the currents of first air, Sculpting the first elements of earth, drawing the first waters of nectar from the well springs of the eternal chalice. All of these he drew from the mother as his great winged spiral swept the universe into motion. The outward yang drawn from the inward yen of our being. In my mind, the two circles join now overlapping at the center. They created the divine portal, the pattern of life that encompassed power in love, honoring all of whom we are in the majesty of truth. 
the one who looks into the mirror and sees itself awakening through the heart of the divine union. I only hope that the time was coming when others would remember this truth and that with the great remembering, we would collectively find the courage to create a brave new world.